You're listening to the FQXI podcast. Today. Which incidentally is different from like what's in my textbook. When I took cosmology and I started out working in cosmology back in the 90s, it's amazing how many discoveries have been made since then. We conclude our countdown of the biggest physics advances of 2023. It's kind of equivalent to saying if you're shooting bows and arrows at a bullseye, if you had both precision and accuracy, all the arrows would land in the exact same spot in the dead center of the bullseye. And what they're saying is that that can't happen. You have to trade off a little bit of one for the other. With quantum physicist Ian Durham. Which is weird. (laughs) It's just weird to wrap your head around that. It's almost, it's kind of weird to try to explain it and it's but it's just fascinating if you look at it and it just fits together ni- just nicely i'm zia morali welcome to the podcast from the foundational questions institute here we are at the final part of our review of the year in physics the first two parts of this countdown covered newsworthy items and a few runners-up And we also revealed the results that sit at number five in our list of physics picks. If you missed those, and we do slightly refer back to them during this edition, you can go and catch up by visiting the podcast page, qspace.fqxi.org slash podcasts, where you'll also find links to more information about all of the stories discussed in this review. You can also find other goodies, such as our recent series of mini documentaries, filmed in physics labs around the world. So, still with me is Ian Durham, a quantum physicist at St. Anselm College in New Hampshire. Ian, in the last edition, you unveiled number five on your list. What comes in at number four? Number four is another sort of pseudo-tie. I just taught a cosmology class this past fall. Where do things like planets and stars and galaxies and stuff come from? So there's this Big Bang and... Very early, you have a quark gluon plasma, and as it cools down, you start to form protons and neutrons, and then eventually some of the neutrons disappear because they get converted. Before they form atoms, they form nuclei. So they start to form things like this helium-4 nucleus that I mentioned in the previous one. That stuff then eventually, that's all ionized gases that then eventually cool even more and attract electrons and they become unionized. They just become neutral gases. And then stuff starts to cool and form atoms. But somewhere along the way, the gases, at least in the interstellar and intergalactic realm, become reionized at some point. So the first of your two joint picks at number four deals with this mystery of reionization and how and why this happened. So the two discoveries that were made this year, first, the James Webb Telescope revealed that it's galaxies in the early universe that led to the reionization. This work was carried out by Anna-Christine Eilers of MIT and colleagues. I'll put a link on the podcast page, qspace.fqxi.org slash podcasts, so you can read more about their discovery. I'm looking at an article from space.com, which describes how you can picture young galaxies as being surrounded by an imaginary balloon with energy from newly formed stars in the galaxy, reionizing the gas in that balloon. The JWST was used to examine the surroundings of an extremely bright quasar, or a supermassive black hole, when the universe was just 900 million years old. By looking at the light emanating from that quasar and travelling towards us, the astronomers could infer details about the composition of the gas that the light passed through. One thing these articles talk about a lot, Ian, is the change between the universe being opaque and transparent. How is that connected to this issue of reionization? The reionization is related, but not exactly, although all the articles seem to suggest it's exactly, but it's not quite related to this era at which point the universe becomes transparent. So early on, photons are coupled to all the matter. So we can only see back so far. It's opaque beyond a certain distance. And at some point, there's this decoupling. Now that decoupling, the photon decoupling and the reionization are not necessarily the same thing. 
They occur at slightly different times, but some of the articles on this sort of conflate those two things. What the Webb Telescope discovered is that it's really the galaxies that are doing the reionization, which incidentally is different from like what's in my textbook. The textbook that I use to teach this semester, this is fascinating, by the way, because when I took cosmology and I started out working in cosmology back in the 90s, it's amazing how many discoveries have been made since then. Things like, for instance, the universe when I was in college, we didn't know it was flat, for example. We had no idea. You know, we learned about the three different possible shapes. And now that's sort of like a footnote. There was no accelerated expansion. We never talked about the cosmological constant. So here I am teaching this course and telling them, well, yes, the reionization is from high energy photons floating around there. And that's what the book says and all that stuff. Well, Webb Telescope says it's really a result of these early galaxies. But that's not the only cosmic discovery related to the epoch of reionization that we want to talk about for number four. There's a connected result that shares the number four spot on your list that has to do with how structure formed from gas in the early universe. Sort of at the same time, as this stuff is cooling, there are tiny instabilities. And these tiny instabilities lead to matter clumping together. And that's how you get the structure that we have in the universe. You get clusters of gas first that then eventually coalesce into stars and galaxies. But in this, when you have these things that start to clump together, you have these overdense regions and underdense regions in the universe. And the overdense ones have a tendency to start to collapse to form structure, and the underdense ones expand. And in the process of doing this, early on in the universe, the baryonic matter, so baryonic matter is matter that is basically anything that's not dark matter. It's stuff that we know, protons, neutrons, it's everyday matter. Baryonic matter, there's slight oscillations that occur in it. They call them baryon acoustic oscillations, BAOs. And these baryon acoustic oscillations are that the size of these bubbles kind of oscillates a little bit until the universe hits a certain level of expansion, and then they sort of start to coalesce into the filaments and things that we see today. Dark matter helps the baryons do this. Anyway, these baryon acoustic oscillations, it's a standard model of how things work, but nobody had ever really seen these before, right? So we have these two things going on. We have these bubbles that are getting created, the baryon acoustic oscillations, and then we have the reionization of the universe. And they're happening at slightly different epochs, but they're kind of related in the sense of it's all because the universe is expanding and cooling and stuff like that. So tell us more about this discovery of baryon acoustic oscillations. You know, this discovery is made by Brent Tully and colleagues using data from Cosmic Flows 4, the largest compilation of precise galaxy distances. The second team was a group from the University of Hawaii that basically discovered a single one of these bubbles that I talked about, these uh, baryon acoustic oscillations. They gave it a traditional Hawaiian name. I'm going to make an attempt at pronouncing the name Ho'olei'ilana. It's a term drawn from the Kumulipo, a Hawaiian creation chant that evokes the origin of structure. The first actual observed baryon acoustic oscillation. So here's the question, or here's one of the questions. If you hadn't been constructing this list, would you have realized that you were about to teach your class something that was wrong? So funny story. I'm constantly monitoring things, partly for this podcast. And so during the year, I flagged interesting stories, and I put them in my 80 million tabs open on my web browser. (laughs) And I flagged this story, both of these stories, months ago, and completely forgot about them. (laughs) So literally last night, uh, the course has ended. I've already turned in grades. Oh, no. I literally sent an email out to my students and said, oh, I forgot to tell you about this, (laughs) and gave them links to these things. I said, oh, yeah, they've We now have this baryon acoustic oscillation. The reionization thing is totally different. So, you know, I did see it before I taught the class, but then forgot about it. So we have these two amazing results. Let me just ask you. So when the JWST was launched, we had, you know, so much anticipation and hope that we'd be getting results like this. Why did we need this kind of big telescope to do that? What information could it give us that we didn't have before? 
Well, one of the things that the JWST is better at is it's literally, I mean, it's a more powerful telescope than Hubble. It's just so much more powerful that it has much, much, much higher resolution. And so what you can now make out that you couldn't before is you can sort of make the distinction between the gas around these early galaxies and the galaxies themselves. There are some interesting pictures that I'm sure that you will put a link to somewhere on the page where you can now see the detail. It's in the near infrared. You can see the galaxy cores and then you see this gas around them. And it's detail that Hubble never would have picked up. And I guess turning to the baryon acoustic oscillation, given the theme of the podcast, maybe not the intentional theme of the podcast, but this idea of work being sort of a little bit uncertain, you know, maybe conclusions being made early, which shouldn't have been made and people being very cautious. I think in one of the earlier ones, you explained that I think for the nuclear physics one, there were very cautious about what they were concluding there and saying it might be wrong. It's interesting here as well that that they first sort of seen hints of this in a research paper in 2016. And they didn't go ahead and just announce that they had found this. They couldn't reach the conclusion at that point. They needed more data. They needed to do more of an analysis. So it just it's just an example of how much time, I guess, it takes to really establish that, that these things are real. Yeah, it all depends on what you're looking at. And physicists are notorious, well, <laughs> used to be notorious for being conservative about these claims and saying, you know, I'm not going to announce this until I know exactly for sure that this is really what I say it is. So what weirdness will be revealed in the top three? Aha. Number three is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. It involves both quantum stuff as well as clocks because I love time. I'm very interested in time. And physicists seem to have found what appears to be a hard limit on how accurate a clock can be. This is work done by Marcus Huber at Vienna University of Technology. I don't know if Marcus is, is Marcus an FQXI member? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marcus Huber is an FQXI member. This is FQXI funded research, I should say. And if I'm not wrong, this theoretical work follows on from work published a year or two ago by Huber along with Natalia Ares, who performed some FQXI-funded experiments on the thermodynamic limits of timekeeping. But at least we know you weren't biased in choosing this result because you didn't even remember, you didn't even realize that Marcus Huber is an FQXI member. And this is FQXI-funded research. Yes, okay. I obviously did not remember this. I didn't realize it at the time. So here it was, FQXI-sponsored work. So what Marcus and his colleagues did is they, they basically show that a perfect clock is impossible. There's a trade-off between precision and resolution. So I've come across this issue in the past. On previous editions, we've spoken about building optical lattice clocks, and I've written about those too. And I know that we need to be very careful about the difference between precision and resolution and accuracy. You can have something that's very, very precise, but it's not accurate, right? So you could be shooting a bow and arrow at a target and all the arrows could land in the same spot. That's very precise, but they're nowhere near the bullseye, which makes them not accurate at all. That's something that's precise, but not accurate. Conversely, you could have accurate where you shoot these arrows at the target and they land all over the place, but the average is the bullseye. So they average out to the center. That's pretty accurate over the long haul, but it sure is not precise because they're not all consolidated. Resolution is a little bit similar to accuracy you can kind of think of. Basically, the time resolution indicates how small the time intervals are that can be measured. Basically, how quickly a clock ticks. You know, you got tick, tock, tick, tock. And so in theory, classically, you would think that there is no limit. You could have something tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. And the second is just arbitrary anyway. Precision, of course, then tells you how precise every single tick is. Is each tick exactly the same? I'll give another example. There's a great clock at Corpus Christi College in Cambridge 
which is a mechanical clock, fascinating clock called the corpus clock. It's accurate something like two or three times a day or something like that, but it does not have consistent TikToks. It's a fascinating clock. Look it up on Wikipedia. So that clock is not very precise in its TikToks. So basically what Huber's team was able to show is that no clock has an infinite amount of energy available, right? So all of this involves energy. Ticking clocks, you've got a swinging pendulum. What is it? It's gravitational energy that's running it. They don't have an infinite amount of energy available, which means they can't generate an infinite amount of entropy. It can never have both perfect resolution and perfect precision at the same time. It's kind of equivalent to saying if you're shooting bows and arrows at a bullseye, if you had both precision and accuracy, all the arrows would land in the exact same spot in the dead center of the bullseye. And what they're saying is that that can't happen. You have to trade off a little bit of one for the other. So why then, why why is this on the list? That's huge. There's a fundamental limit to how accurate a clock can be? Wow, that's pretty interesting. There was a whole FQXI essay contest about is the universe discrete or continuous? I argued that regardless of the answer, our knowledge of it would always be discrete. So it might be continuous, but we'll never have better than discrete knowledge of it. And this sort of supports my argument. So you like it because it backs up your thinking. Yes, I like it because it backs up my own theory. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Is this similar to when we hear things about quantum mechanics, you know, where they say you can't know the position and momentum of an object at the same time, for instance? Is it a similar kind of trade-off? This demonstrates another one of these quirky things that pops up, not just in quantum systems, but even in classical systems. You always have these situations where there's a trade-off. You know, in quantum mechanics, we think of this in terms of what we call commutation relations, which is basically where the uncertainty principle comes from, which says, you, you know, you can't measure certain types of measurements simultaneously to a perfect accuracy or perfect precision or whatever. There are actually classical examples that are similar to this too. And this happens a lot in science. You've got things where you have a trade-off that has to happen. And in this case, it's the precision and resolution thing. I will put a link to an article about this work on the podcast page, qspace.fqxi.org slash podcasts, where Huber talks about the implications of this fundamental limit on clocks for quantum computing. The idea is that this will ultimately have an impact on the speed and reliability that quantum computers can achieve. It's not yet an issue. There are bigger things to worry about with the precision of components and the electromagnetic fields used to control qubits. But according to Huber's calculations, we're not that far from the regime where this could become a problem. I'll also add links to some mini documentaries that we have made. One is called Austria's Quantum Machines and features Marcus Huber at the University of Vienna. And another is filmed at Oxford University in which Natalia Ares, whom I mentioned earlier, talks about testing the fundamental thermodynamic limits of time with clocks that she and her colleagues have built from carbon nanotubes. Ares also spoke about this research, including her collaboration with Huber, at the last FQXI meeting, which took place earlier this year in the summer in Yorkshire in the UK. We will have her talk from Yorkshire and others posted to our site, qspace.fqxi.org slash videos, early in the new year. So please keep checking back for those. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll find us as FQXI or follow us on social media. We're pretty much everywhere as FQXI or FQXI Physics to see when those are posted. You can also go to the QSpace page and scroll down to the bottom and subscribe to our newsletter to keep updated whenever we have new things for you to look at. Just to say, Ian... I mentioned our meeting in Yorkshire. You were in the room with us, listening to Natalia speaking about her work with Marcus. So I don't know how you forgot. <laughs> yeah, apparently, I 
completely forgot about that. Yeah, well, you, we can tell you weren't paying any attention because you had no idea who's even an FQXI member or not. I, I did pay attention to her talk. I want <laughs> to make that very clear. I was paying attention. He was. He just, he, you know, he was paying as much attention as he was when, when Ian, you were teaching your class to yeah. your students about cosmology exactly. and, and forgot to mention. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> that you were yeah. teaching them completely the wrong thing. But he gives all of his attention to this podcast, don't you, Ian? So that's that's the important I thing. I do. I do. I do. Yes. <laughs> but yes, the other thing we should mention here, Ian, I think, is that last year we did promise people that you would be giving a course on the nature of time. And we have actually started recording that. It has been moving along. So I'll put out a call once again if you are interested in potentially taking part in this course with Ian Durham on the nature of time from cosmos to consciousness. I've got that the right way around, I hope. That is correct. From cosmos to consciousness. Be interesting if it was the other way around. But <laughs> That's true. Possibly more controversial. Yes. Yeah, then email us at qacademy at fqxi.org and I will put your name on the list so you'll be the first to hear how to sign up to it. And we'll have more information soon about that. Apologies for being so slow. Or email us at podcast.fqxi.org to ask to have your name added to the list. Congratulations to Marcus Huber and colleagues. As we say, FQXI members, but there was no bias because Ian had forgotten that they were FQXI members. And to be honest, you can go back and listen to all of our previous end of year countdowns if you want. We don't get that many FQXI members on there. So I think we're definitely not biased towards them. So well done. Well done for once. We're on the list. We're in the top three. They definitely deserve at least a T-shirt. Yes, absolutely. They deserve a T-shirt. Number two. Okay, so number two, still on the topic of time, because I love time, a group led by Ricardo Sapienza has performed a double slit diffraction experiment in time. So that's weird. What is the standard double slit experiment? Most people are probably familiar with the original double slit experiment performed in 1801 by Thomas Young at the Royal Institution, which basically showed the wave nature of light. You pass light of one wavelength, monochromatic light, we say, through two very, very evenly, very closely spaced narrow slits. And you'll see on the screen or whatever you have behind you, a uh, wall, you will see an interference pattern appear. That's a spatial interference pattern. Well, these guys have done a double slit experiment where the pattern isn't spatial, it's temporal, which is weird. <laughs> it's just weird to wrap your head around that. It's kind of weird to try to explain it. And yet explain it you must, Ian. How do you create temporal slits? And how do you then spot a temporal interference pattern? an interference pattern in time rather than space. Here's what they did. They have this semiconductor mirror that they turned the reflectivity of this mirror. We just talked about mirrors a couple of times. They turned it on and off very quickly in succession. And they recorded interference fringes, so the light and dark waves, but they recorded them in what's called the frequency spectrum. So they're looking at it in a slightly different way. We think about light has a wavelength, right? But you can also describe light as having a frequency. The interesting thing about the frequency way of looking at it is that frequency is the units, a hertz, a single hertz, named after Heinrich Hertz, is a inverse second. So it's naturally related to this idea of time. So when you start to talk about interference and in frequencies, you're now talking about sort of a fundamental temporal kind of domain here. So they were turning these the reflectivity on and off very, very quickly and recording interference fridges in the frequency spectrum. So basically what they're doing is it's like they're turning the slit on and off, on and off, on and off. And so if you have two slits rapidly appear and then disappear one after the other, it should cause the incoming waves to sort of maintain their path in space, but spread out in frequency. And that's the time diffraction. 
Okay, so I was having a hard enough time visualizing the spherical cubes, but I'm going to take a bit of time, possibly after this podcast, to try and work out what's going on with these temporal slits. But let me ask you, you started off by talking about Young's double slit experiments, and you talked about how this interference experiment established that light was a wave. And, you know, a lot of our podcast listeners will have heard us talking about the double slit experiment on a number of different occasions where we then go on and we talk about sort of extensions to that, which prove that light has a sort of a wave part called duality. I don't want to go into that. I will put up links to other versions of the podcast and articles or whatever where we have established that. Now we're talking about this temporal double slit experiment and I guess what I'm asking is is this just the temporal equivalent of the very first one where we discovered that light was a wave is it more weird and quantumy like the more complex version where we discover that light is a wave and a particle at the same time have we discovered something else that's new is this unexpected Or is it just weird? You know, what exactly have we got to with this result? I will actually say that other than the fact that I would be the kind of person who say that everything is quantum, this is really not a purely quantum thing. So it's more equivalent to Young's kind of experiment. It's classical light. They're just using laser pulses. It's purely classical in that sense. Was it unexpected or is this the sort of thing that we would think should happen if we could just do the experiment? Um, That's a good question. I mean, I'm sure it's not something I ever thought of. It's not something I'd ever seen an article on. I've never seen anybody thinking about this and saying, oh yeah, someone ought to do this. This ought to be possible. I don't want to say it doesn't surprise me because it clearly I've made it number two because I think it's a pretty wild result when you think about it. You've got this interference pattern that's interfering in time. There's a temporal interference happening. Something is interfering with something else at a different time. That's weird. That's weird. So yeah, there is a little bit of the unexpected here. I don't think it necessarily says any of our physics is wrong. It just says that, yeah, we don't fully understand time. It's number two because wow. And it brings up all sorts of these issues about what the nature of time is. I hate to ask you this question after this, because I think you've made a very good case for why it is number two. But is there any practical kind of application of this? You know, these guys, I guess, say that it could improve their understanding of thinly layered materials, which is how they created the slits. So they're talking about creating these time varying metamaterials, which would be useful for very fast optical switches for signal processing and stuff like that might even be useful for optical computing. Not there are a whole lot of optical computers out there, but you know, it's foundational. It's cool. And it raises issues of, you know, what's going on in time? Like what is time? Just think about what does it mean? What does it really mean on a fundamental level? to have something interfere with something else at a different time. Like they don't exist at the same time as one another, and yet they produce some kind of interference pattern. That should be weird. That should seem weird to anyone who thinks about it. Yep, that is legitimately weird. It's weird. And it has earned this research group at Imperial College London an FQXI mug or tote bag or something. Or something. Should they choose to claim it. So, what could keep that magnificent result away from the number one spot? And I like this one. I've got to to say, I really like this one. It just tickles me. I had this one flagged as number one for a long time, and it's very unusual. It's not on anyone else's list, partly because it's somewhat mathematical. Before I introduce it, let's talk about this idea of tiling. We talked about it with one of the runners-up before. We'll just talk about it in two dimensions. So you go and you put tiles down on your kitchen floor, your bathroom floor. Typically, they're squares. You know, you have a pattern. You can tile in all sorts of interesting ways. So most tilings, if you look at your own floors, most tilings are periodic in that the pattern repeats. It trivially repeats if you've got squares or triangles or whatever, or hexagons, as the case is with bee honeycombs that we talked about earlier. But there are tilings that don't necessarily involve the same 
shape. You could have a couple of different shapes that you put together, and yet they still repeat, right? You get a repetition. There's a symmetry to them. And tiling has been an interesting mathematical problem for a long time. And FQXI member Sir Roger Penrose actually did some groundbreaking work in tiling in the late 1960s. One of the questions, though, is, so suppose you take a weird shape. It's got to be able to fit together. So let's suppose you take a shape. I don't know. It's like a sideways, weird looking thing that has maybe five sides, but it's not a pentagon. It's who knows what. And you want to tile your floor with that. So you tile your floor with copies of this thing and they don't all fit together the same way. So sometimes, you know, the long side will be up against the short side or something like that. And you'll go through and you'll tile your floor with that. And the question is, is do you ever get a repeating pattern in that? If you get a repeating pattern at some point, it's called a periodic tiling. And the quest has been to find an aperiodic tiling, a tiling where it doesn't repeat ever. And Penrose found one of these in 1970, but it involved two tiles. These Penrose tilings, if you go to the Mathematical Institute at Oxford, which Sir Roger goes to every day, the guy is absolutely amazing. I mean, if you haven't seen the FQXI interview with him at Puzzle X, watch it. I'll certainly put a link to the fireside chat with Sir Roger Penrose on the site, qspace.fqxi.org slash podcasts. He's a great guy. I saw him at a conference recently, had dinner with him. He still goes to work every day. He was the last guy out of the dinner at, at the conference. It was like 1130 at night. The guy's like 93. Anyway, when he goes to work every day, he walks over the front entrance to the Mathematical Institute is actually a tiling of uh, his tiles. But anyway, so there's been this desire to find, can you find a single tile that it never repeats, that you never get a repeating pattern, that you can tile your floor with it and your floor can be infinite and you never get this repeating pattern. It's called an aperiodic monotile. It's a single tile. And the big discovery this year is that within two weeks of one another, the same group of researchers found two. I encourage everybody to go to the links that Zia will put on and look at some of the pictures so you understand what these tiles are, because this is such a visual thing. Yes, pictures will be on the site. You might want to look at them as we're talking because this is a really visual story or catch up with them afterwards. And Ian, they have a lovely name. So these things, by the way, are called Einsteins. <laughs> it's not Einstein like the name. It kind of really is, though. Although it's a play on Einstein's name. It's Ein space Stein, which means one rock in German. Einstein or one stone, right? And these guys discovered two of them. The first one they discovered is called the hat. They call it the hat a periodic monotile. I'm not entirely sure why they call it the hat, but they do. I'm looking at it now. It doesn't look a huge amount like a hat. It's a fairly simple little shape, and it's but it's just fascinating if you look at it, and it just fits together ni just nicely. No matter how many times you keep adding it on, you will never see a repetition of the same pattern. And on qspace.fqxi.org slash podcasts, we'll also link to an interactive application where you can tile these shapes yourselves or shape these tiles yourselves. One of those two. So you can play around with them, which I think is even cooler. Actually, now that I think about it, I think they call it the hat because it looks a little bit like a hat. I'm still not seeing it. Like a floppy hat? Like kind of like a floppy hat. Anyway, so two weeks after the hat, the same guys came up with another one called the Spectre, just like the evil organization in James Bond. <laughs> okay, I, I can see the floppy hat shape now, but this other one doesn't look like a Spectre to me, whatever a Spectre looks like. So from going from no aperiodic monotiles, we now have two. Is there any difference in quality between them or are they just two different shapes, but they basically do the same thing? So the hat aperiodic monotile does solve the question of whether there's a single shape that can force aperiodicity in the plane. But all tilings by the hat require reflections, meaning they have to incorporate both the left and right handed hats. In order to make it work, you have to flip the hat. Okay, so this hat one works, but in some sense also is a bit sneaky. But with Spectre, you don't have to flip the shape to force the aperiodicity in the tiling. And that is what the Spectre 
resolved. And they also have an interactive application where you can play around with the Spectre as well. So I am full of questions on this one. My first comment when I was reading the article about it was it broke my heart because they said that mathematicians do actually tile their bathrooms and kitchens with Penrose tiling. And I have just tiled my bathroom Ugh. and my kitchen. Ugh. And now it's like, it's just a lost opportunity. And so I'm I'm just gutted about that. Did you do it? You didn't do it in a Penrose tiling? I didn't, no. no. I just no. used square tiles and rectangular tiles. Oh, and a circular tile. Ah, oh, there you yeah, go. That was, and I was proud of that. And now now I'm just going to be like, eh, whatever, because it's not <laughs> Penrose tiling. But aside from <laughs> aside from my redecoration woes, my first question is, how do they prove that they have found an aperiodic monotile or indeed how did Roger Penrose prove the case when he was doing it with two tiles? How do you know? Oh, well, that is a million dollar question. Again, some of this gets at the abstractness of mathematics. So for example, in the paper, they have this thing called a tile one, one. Okay. So it's the word tile, capital T, parentheses, one comma one. And this thing is defined to be, it's an equilateral polygon. It has 14 unit length edges and 14 vertices. And then they say that this thing is a specter if and only if it has certain behaviors. There are different operations you can perform in geometry. And they're related to symmetries, right? You can translate something, which means to move it from one place to another. You can rotate something which is exactly what it sounds like. And you can reflect it through a plane. And there are other operations. And all of these operations relate to some kind of a symmetry. And the whole idea of these is that you get an aperiodic monotile with a specter anyway, only by translating and rotating and not, you can't do any mirror operations on it. Now, how do they prove that it's absolutely aperiodic? <laughs> Unlike the other paper that we talked about before, where there were no pictures, their paper does have pictures in it. They get into combinatorics. It's very, very technical and very, very abstract. That's how they prove it. I really want to write a short story now called Sir Roger Penrose and the Mystery of the Spectre and the Hat. Some kind of murder mystery. I just, I just feel like this is kind of crying out for that. There's a really nice article from Three Quarks Daily about Spectre that I will link to on the podcast page, qspace.fqxi.org slash podcasts, that talks about the visual appeal of tiling with a picture of an aperiodic tiling on the Federation Square building in Melbourne, Australia. It also talks about a link between tiling problems and the limits of computation, which can be investigated by thinking about Turing machines, which can hypothetically run any computer algorithm. So in the 1960s, apparently, Robert Berger proved that a Turing machine can be converted to a set of coloured tiles and that the halting of the Turing machine is equivalent to using those tiles to tile a plane with an aperiodic pattern. If the machine halts, the tile cannot tile the plane. But if the machine does not halt, the tiles can be used to tile the plane with an aperiodic pattern. Wow, I didn't I was totally unaware of that. That's from the 60s. I should give credit to Jonathan Kujawa for that discussion. I'm sorry, I did not want to reduce this rather lovely foundational discussion to computing, but it struck me as an enchanting connection and I had to mention it. There are a lot of computational implications for them. Imagine you have an, one of these aperiodic monotiles, right? So it's a pattern that never, ever, ever repeats. Well, I can think of one immediate implication for that that could be very, very useful, and that's cryptography. If you picked your, say, passwords using an aperiodic monotile, it would be very hard to break something like that. One of the things I want to say that's very interesting about these things, there's Spectre, there's also the hat, and then there's another one they have called the turtle. <laughs> All of these things are actually made up of sections of neighboring hexagons. So remember, we talked about hexagons and how bees seem to have figured out that hexagons are the perfect 
shape for tiling the plane, for periodic tiling the plane. There is a couple of figures in their paper where you can see that they're creating these tiles by basically you've got a just a bunch of hexagons and then they kind of section out pieces of neighboring hexagons and create these new shapes. And one of the reasons that this is they do this is because let's say you said that you tiled your bathroom with circular tiles, right? Now you can't, it's impossible. Well, <laughs> until we just learned about this foam problem, right? Which is a little bit more abstract. Theoretically, you can't tile your bathroom solely with circles. Like you'd have spaces between the circles. You'd have to have another shape in there. If you want stuff to ensure that it fits together just right, you can break it up by these chunks of hexagons. And then you always have a way where you can always make them fit some way, shape, or form. So I encourage people to just at least take a look at the paper just to see the pretty pictures and to just get this sense of what they look like and how they're forming some of these things. I will say you are correct. My tiles are not solely circular. They are sort of square tiles with circles sticking out the sides and then they interlock with each other like jigsaw puzzles around the circular edges. But yeah, circles within squares. So yes, yes, you are, you are, of course, correct there. So congratulations to our number one winners. I was going to say David Smith has a mug on his way, but then he started the whole thing about hexagons and bees. And somehow I feel like the bees have really won this whole countdown, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, I realize we didn't mention the authors. It's David Smith, Joseph Myers, Craig Kaplan, and Chaim Goodman Strauss. Chaim Goodman Strauss is actually at the National Museum of Mathematics in New York, which I've been meaning to go to for quite some time. Go along there and present him with his hoodie. Yes. <laughs> I almost forgot David Smith. David Smith, who is the lead author on this, is actually just a hobbyist. Okay, that is truly impressive. He's a retired print technician and an aficionado of jigsaw puzzles, fractals, and roadmaps. And he was basically just playing with shapes using a software package called Polyform Puzzle Solver. I don't know how he got in touch with these other guys who were mathematicians, but he did. Lo and behold. So this the guy who's the lead author on this paper is actually just an amateur. And I shouldn't say just an amateur. I mean, he's not a an academic. He definitely he definitely deserves a prize. And he lives in Yorkshire. Oh really? Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> so we could both turn up on his doorstep and present him with a prize. We could, yes. <laughs> so yes, congratulations to them for reaching number one and obviously just taking inspiration from the bees, who are the most impressive physicists. Of us all, I guess. Yes, congratulations to the winners. There we have it. 2023 done. 2023 is done. Wrapped up. So, wishing everyone a happy 2024. Happy 2024. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, Zia. Goodbye. No controversy, really. Not in the top five. You're slipping. Yes, we were going to do a... A shout out to my friend Carl. Hi, Carl, who, who listens to this every year and has a problem with uh, the British pronunciation of the word controversy. And he says it's it's not controversy, it's controversy. But um, of course, I always tell him, but the British are the ones who invented the language. But there was no controversy this year, so he can't even complain. That's right. There wasn't one. So yeah, he can't complain. Oh, well, sorry, Carl.